Monday, September 2nd. It is a Labor Day. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk, episode number 766. I hope everybody is having a fantastic three-day weekend. I hope you are, uh, I hope you're alive. <laughs> Just got back from Springfield, where was it? Missouri, Springfield, Missouri. Did the Blue Room, first time headlining there. And I got to say, fantastic club, fantastic owners, amazing audiences. It was really uh it was really a great opportunity to run four one-hour sets before I shoot my special next Sunday. And it was really good to do it out in Springfield, Missouri, because it was my first time there. And a lot of people had seen me there with Bill Burr about six months ago when we did the arena. So they came out and they did it old school way. Saw me do 20 minutes and said, let's go see more. And thank God they did. I got to run the, uh, run the, the special in order and just make sure that thing is, uh, is tight. It's feeling good. I'm, I'm ready as uh, pretty much as I'll ever be. I've been running the shit out of it. I did San Diego last week. I, I did a place. Uh, what was that hotel? Um, shit, I can't remember. Hold on, I got it right here because I want to give it a shout out. It was one of the coolest gigs I've done in a long time. This hotel called, um, let's see here. It was the, ah, well, the place is called Lulu's Lounge and it's in this hotel in San Diego. My good friend Mal Hall put on the show and it just knocked me out. And so did the Blue Room, man. Um, great, great club. It's kind of how I want to do comedy. I want to go into a, a city in a club with good owners that aren't, you know, awful. You do a lot of clubs and you just, you're just like, wow, what am I doing here? And then you'll do these clubs that just do it right, like Acme in uh, Minneapolis, Blue Room. Uh, the the uh, comedy fort in Fort Collins, the punchline, just clubs that just do it right. Treat the comics right. They're not trying to fucking nickel and dime everyone. It was great. Humid as fuck out there. I can't I, I can't do humidity. I'm not I'm not ever going to live anywhere where it's humid. I just can't do it. Just wet all the time. I want to give a. Uh, uh, one more time, a reminder that this Sunday in, in um, Tennessee, Pelham, Tennessee, an hour or so outside of Nashville, in between Nashville and Chattanooga, I am shooting my special at the Caverns. This is the last week to get tickets. They're almost gone. The first show is sold out. We're close to selling out the second show. It'll be Bill Burr. Um, coming out hosting, then he'll bring me on. I'll shoot the special. Then Bill Burr will come back out and do a, a, a nice set for you guys. It's, it's going to be fucking fun as shit to see what happens inside this cave. None of us have been in there. Club Soda Kenny will be with us. Marcus Price is directing and uh, a lot of good friends coming out. Steve McDonald, my buddy will be there. Who else is coming out? Greg Riley. Long-time friends coming out to support. Brian the Bootmaker will be there. Oh, man, I'll be wearing his boots on stage. So I'm feeling good. And uh, I can't thank you guys enough for your, uh, your support and all your kind words this week. It is nine years today, nine years to the date, when I was run over on my motorcycle and almost killed and... You know, I, I remember I posted it up last year and some guy said, give it a break, man. Let it go. It's like, I'm never going to let that go. Every Labor Day, it reminds me of almost dying. And whoever posted that, I'm sure they got like a fucking splinter. You know, working their goddamn labor job. <laughs> and uh, they still talk about, it. man, I was out there. Hammer nails, and I got a splinter. 
Go fuck yourself. I got ran over by a meth head doing 70 miles an hour in a fucking Escalade she stole, and I'm here alive. Hell yeah, I'm going to talk about it every Labor Day. It just reminds me of one of the most insane days of my life. So glad to be here. Glad to be doing this podcast. And, uh, you know, fucking life's going by so fucking fast. That was nine years ago already. Somebody asked me yesterday, how long ago was that? And I go, I don't know, like seven years ago. I looked it up, nine years. And uh, nuts. Uh, shout out to a brand new Patreon. That's what we do here. You sign up for the Patreon. I do a little shout out. And uh, today's shout out goes out to Chris Hardgrove, brand new Patreoner. And... Uh, Solid Human joins my Patreon. Everybody out there, if you join the Patreon, it really helps me on this side of the podcast because I obviously I rarely have uh, advertisements on here. And so, you know, it really helps. So patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. But speaking of sponsors, I do have a sponsor today. You know, I'm a huge fan of microdosing. I've been microdosing for uh, a few years now, and it's really helped with uh, depression and uh, creativity. Writer's block, get a little writer's block. I go for the psilocybin microdosing, the gummies. And the only company I use now are Colors Gummies. That's C O L O R S gummies.net. Clean. Clean gummies. None of this bullshit. Um, it's, it's real psilocybin. It's not that synthetic fake shit, man. I, I didn't even know when I was first doing gummies. I didn't know there was synthetic psilocybin. Fuck that shit. This is all organic. 100% clean. Use the code DEAN. D-E-A-N. They will deliver right to your house. Wherever you're at. Free shipping on all orders over 100 bucks. Colorsgummies.net. I'm rocking one right now. Great for energy, memory, focus, mood, creativity, motivation. This shit's real. This is not some placebo effect, you know, bullshit that the big pharma tries to pass off. Ah, that's bullshit. Here, take some of this fucking Prozac. Take these chemicals. Nah, stay away from that shit. Colors gummies. Use the code Dean. All right, let me let me just give you uh, what's going on with the show today. Twelve years a slave. Once upon a time in Hollywood, Narcos, Argo. Oh my God, this guy has done some movies. Twelve years ago, this guy. Sat down as my guest for episode six. We both couldn't even remember what we talked about, but we had an incredible conversation today. My guest is Scoot McNary, incredible actor. He is one of those guys, a lot like Philip Seymour, before Philip Seymour hit it on Capote. Remember, Philip, you would just see him in movies. You wouldn't remember his name. He'd be like, oh, oh that fucking guy, Boogie Nights, he's great. Oh, yeah, the guy on Almost Famous. He's great. Who is that guy? That's a lot like Scoot McNary. He's done tons of film and TV. You see him in all the good stuff. And he is here today. And uh, he's just a great friend. We talk motorcycles. We talk filmmaking. We talk comedy. He's just a solid human. I, I, you know, if I didn't live in L.A., I wouldn't have... Friends like Scoot McNary, man. Great, great, solid friends. Oh, shit, he was in Batman versus Superman for you fucking superhero movie people. This guy's credits are unreal. It is insane. Anyway, great to have you, Scoot. Thank you, and great to have all of you tuning in today. Have a great, great weekend, and enjoy the ride. Uh-oh, he did Herbie Fully Loaded. Oh, I should have talked to him about that. Wasn't that Lindsay Lohan? Let's see here, Lindsay Lohan. It, it was, right? Lindsay Blowhands. Remember they were calling her that? 
Matt Dillon was in that. Holy shit, he worked with Matt Dillon. The main thing is we really get into Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is both of our, uh, one of our favorite films. Here he is right now. Thank you, guys. Keep the candles lit. I will see you soon. Scoot McNary. Just, uh... So, wait, you, so you did, like, the early days of Let the Be Talk. Man, I would love for you to try and dig it up and see... Not now, but, like, yeah. when... And just see what the hell we were talking about. You know, that's funny, because... I've been doing it 12 years, so 764 episodes. And, you know, early on, still to this day, I booked the podcast myself, and it's all random. Like, you were at the comedy store a couple nights ago, and you're like, hey, let's do the podcast. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's how it's been the whole time. But those early years, the first five years, you're just like, fuck, Monday's coming. I need a guest. Yes. What am I going to do? You know, but now if I don't have a guest, I just go on and talk, you know? Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think I even had anything to probably talk about other than motorcycles. I think yeah. you had like 12 motorcycles and just jammed in your garage. Yeah. And I think that's really what we connected over through our, our buddy, common friend, uh, Taylor and motorcycles. So maybe it was just about riding bikes or something. Yeah, we met in the early days of me moving to L.A. I've been here, I think, 23 years or something. I moved here in, when I was, fuck, what? I can't even remember now. I think 32 or something. I'm 58 now. So, okay, yeah, I moved one here when I was 23. Yeah. So. And we meet, uh, I, I was staying at this, uh, my guitar player's house on Gower. That's what it was. Yeah, and Peter... And Taylor, these I had these wild neighbors who were wild at the time for me because I was on the back end of my wild years, you know. And they lived right next door, and they totally. would just have these parties. And it was early Silver Lake Los Feliz hipster, sure. early, man. I mean, this is like the ground zero of hipsters. And you go over there, and it would just be this killer parties. You know, of let cool me, people. Let me tell you, that house yeah. is still in the family. It is? Uh, I believe Andy Clockwise, uh, musician, still rents it. Wow. To this day. And I remember that when, after Taylor and Peter and them, uh, that Truth and Salvage band moved in there, and they turned the basement into a rehearsal space. And <laughs> I mean, so many, so many crazy nights and just crazy days and breakfasts. I mean, it was such a great uh, community house for everybody in Beechwood Canyon. I remember just meeting them like by random because Taylor was the type of guy. I always, uh, I would say he was kind of a, a, a Kennedy, but not a Kennedy. That yeah. kind of character, a young, good looking guy, wealthy family. Didn't care what happened each day. Let's have a good time. Charismatic. Totally. He's still that way. You know what, you know what he's doing now? No. Driving boats in Mallorca. What? He was like, uh, you know, he was like, he was a club promoter. Right. He was a club promoter. After, I guess, you had met him. Um, and uh, I don't know, probably about four or five years ago, he goes, I'm over it. I'm done. I'm moving to Mallorca to drive boats. Wow. And he did it, and he's still there, and he's, you know, happy as a clam. That's fucking crazy. So it, it's, really, it's really cool to see where you're, first of all, let's introduce yourself. People are like, who's, who's on here? Who the hell is this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My name is Scoot McNary. Now, Scoot, I met, and I meet him, and I say, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm out here trying to be an actor and that was everybody it was either rock and roll or acting back then and it was really wild because i remember at one point i'm watching argo and there you are and i'm like holy shit that's my friend you know and that's really when it seemed to me and I, I was telling somebody earlier this morning when you were coming over that you reminded me a lot of Philip Seymour in a way of like you kept popping up in these films. That's how Philip was before Capote. You'd be like, oh, that one guy kills it in Almost Famous. That one guy in Boogie Nights. And, and you know who was like that uh, until he got really big was Jesse Pol uh, Pullman. 
Jesse Plemons. Yeah, Plemons. Yeah, Sorry. solid. Actor. Yeah, solid fucking actor. He was another guy like that where you start seeing him and seeing him. And I started seeing you and seeing you and seeing you. And I was like, this, I got goosebumps, you know, because I'm like, fuck, my friend is doing it, you know? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, man, I can't tell you how grateful I am for everything that's happened. But also, it's been a wild ride for me, too. I, I hadn't, I didn't see any of this coming, you know, I just sort of mostly have just been putting my head down and trying to move forward. Um, but, um, dude, Philip Seymour Hoffman, is <sighs> one of the legends. I mean, definitely somebody who I studied for years. Uh, and Jesse Plemons, too. I mean, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's been wild. That's what's so great about this business in this town is that like you can feel total shit one day and everything can change the next day or feel amazing one day and then total shit the next day. And that roller coaster... I think is what really keeps you coming back is the unknown. It's really true. Uh, last night I had one of the best sets I've had in months. And then I was just laying in bed feeling so fucking good, you know? And it's just the small things like that that I can't imagine without the big lows, you wouldn't understand the highs. 100%. So you're out there and you're grinding. And is Argo the really the bi first big thing you do? I mean, I don't uh, As far as like studio wise, right. yeah, 100% that had a, uh, you know, really good part in a, in a movie. And then also the movie ended up getting huge legs, winning an Academy Award. So yeah. that was a big part of it. But no, man, I was kicking around the independent market doing these independent films for almost a decade yeah. before I ended up... Um, working on Argo and then there was another film I did before that called Killing Them Softly oh yeah yeah oh yeah it's sort of like um, I don't know what you would say put me on a very small map yeah um, and so yeah man it was a wave or a roller coaster and it you know again like it's, it's not till I do some something like this that we sort of go back and talk about it that I that I really remember like oh yeah man I forgot about that I forgot about that it's just been such a wash of just and you still feel like you're never gonna work again. Oh, hundred percent. I'm I'm that daily. I'm that daily. Yeah, and people are like, "What do you mean? That's crazy!" And I'm like, "It's a true, true feeling of like, oh, well, maybe, maybe that last one was it. Yeah, you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that one's it." So I remember talking to Juliette Lewis, not like five years ago or so, and she was like, it, it, "It's, I think it's over for me." You know, this is Juliette Lewis. No, dude, she's she's like, you know, ageism is a real thing. I'm not getting called in for anything. And look at her last three years. Just fucking powerhouse. Oh, yeah. And and I think the most, because uh, I've experienced heavy ageism in the, um, uh, in the comedy world. And I think what the industry is missing is when you're in middle America... People love real people. The kid, you know, they don't like the Botoxed up, blasted up, fucking phony, you know, I think I'm 30. They like, like a, uh, you know, what was that movie? It was like three years ago where the woman was working at Amazon for Christmas and then oh. living in a trailer. Uh, yes. Um, What's her name? Uh, um, God, I love her from Fargo. Fr uh, Fr Francis McDormand. Yeah. Uh, that, look at her career Fantastic Playing real people man And those are the stories that knock me the fuck out Yeah I, I feel the same way I mean, Those are a lot of times the stories that I'm also attracted to Is it something you can really relate to Or you know really see yourself in I mean uh, uh, There is something about like uh, Seeing that realism Or that rawness of, of, of People that you see in your everyday life And relate and finding some sort of Relationship to that or relation To that I think the hardest thing About acting right now If I was uh, You know I've done some fucking Acting you know, I, I, I call it street Acting I did a movie <laughs> with Mike Beach You know he's from Juilliard and yeah. I, he's a, I go you're a trained act. I'm a street actor and he would laugh About that all the time because I didn't know What the fuck I was doing at all Man I feel the same yeah. I feel like I was a street actor I, uh, you know a confession to make I was sitting on a, a table read for Fargo Yeah, and I'm sitting across from you know David Thewlis and Michael Schulberg and, and, and Ewan McGregor and um, 
I forget who else was. And I was sitting, these are all Juilliard trained Rada. And I was sitting there at the table, like not paying attention to the table read, just looking at everybody going, what the fuck am I doing at this table? <laughs> yeah, like right. any second now, they're going to find out that, they're going to find out. You yeah, know? yeah, and, uh, yeah. Y- you know, um, so... Y- I don't know, man. Yeah, I feel like I was a beating the pavement, beating the concrete kind of actor that was just trying to get training anywhere that would take me. Yeah. To me, now that I'm a comedian for 15 years, if I had the reps of acting like I did comedy, I could probably be really good at it because what it is, is especially with me, is once I know the material... You can just get lost in it and you can become it. But when you're trying to remember the lines, like I did one movie where I had long fucking monologues and you're just <laughs> like, this is awful, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And it's a scene where I'm walking and talking, you know, and you got to hit your beats at marks and shit, you know? So it, it is interesting. Um, and also, like you said, I did a movie with Dennis Hopper, and you're looking at these guys, and you're thinking they're looking at you while you're doing a scene going, is this where my career is at? I'm working with these fucking flunkies. Is this Hollywood now? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what you're thinking. It's yeah. getting in your fucking head. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I always feel it doesn't matter what set I'm on or, or who I'm working with. I always feel a sense of gratitude now and gratefulness that, that, that I'm just working um, I mean, there's something about a set of a whole bunch of people that are creative yeah. all coming together, usually, on, especially on independent films, working for not a lot of money. The, it's, there's passion. And, like, it's just so different. Um, it's such a different experience. The, man, I'm always feeling like that when I'm on set. I'm just like, okay, awesome. We're, like, making something. Yeah. We're making something. Something that we're going to actually see the fruits of our labor versus there's so many actors out there that has been so much time laying down tapes and memorizing these lines and putting auditions on tapes that it's like you just and i can feel that 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 pain of like i just want to see the fruits of all this hard work that that i that i've been doing so i always pinch myself and remind myself like hey you know you work you, we've all worked on this and now we're going to be able to see the the fruits of it whether it goes somewhere or not is irrelevant yeah we're going to finish the movie and we're going to make it i was just talking about that on my podcast i was walking through the neighborhood here and i saw a set going down and it stopped me in my tracks because it just reminded me how much i loved you know you go somewhere like fucking shreveport louisiana at the time you're complaining like i can't believe i'm out here there's no good food it's <laughs> it's fucking humid there's bugs but then you think about it later on and you go, fuck, man. It was like me and Ice Cube, you know, like yeah. we're out here fucking cracking jokes and, and for two months. And, and that set thing of, you know, just everybody catering, costume, makeup. That energy. That energy is fucking cool, yeah, man. It's great, man. It's adi- and it's addicting. Too. Oh, God, yeah. yeah just that, that energy around set, man. Um, it can really just change your whole attitude about everything. You know what's missing in the um, acting world now, two things, good roles and good films are missing. Um, and when one happens, it, you're like, holy shit, how come they don't make more of these? Like in the 90s, you know, you got great shit. You got Drugstore Cowboy, those type mm-hmm. of movies, great you know, movie. uh, Gummo, just weird shit being made. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the indie scene was really fire. But what's really missing to me, if you look at the 70s, Into the early 80s, there were these platforms where actors got to earn their chops. And it might be cheesy shit, but you got to work every week like on a love boat, a fantasy island, a magnum P.I. You would just go in, you do these guest roles, and you got to keep working until you got a film. Well, also, too, this Roger Corman, you know what I mean? Yeah. you know, we need a, a guy, and, and we, we did with, with, with Megan Ellison. You know, she really came in and financed these films that I think a lot of studios wouldn't touch and didn't feel like were profitable. And maybe some of them weren't profitable. Right. But at the end of the day, she was putting money behind incredible scripts, incredible stories like Moonlight. And, and, and yeah. Oh, my God. Inc- Unbelievable. Incredible stories that students wouldn't touch. And it's like she is kind of the, the modern day Roger Corman, you know, and, and it feels like 
we always need somebody like that in the industry because um, the movies that she financed and put out are some of the greatest films over the last 10, 15, 15 years. And so, um, you know, and I think that actors and artists or directors are always searching for, for that same, you know, iconic independent producer, you know, or producer that will come in and do that. So that it's so important to just like the seventies, you know, you need somebody coming in and saying, I understand it's might not be profitable, profitable, but this story needs to be told. Totally. 12 years of slave. You were in that. 12 years One of, slave. of the great fucking films, 12 years of slave. Incredible you know? film, incredible filmmaker, uh, Steve McQueen, um, insane cast. Um, I mean, geez, again, I was pinching myself so lucky to be involved in a project. that's is powerful and has a message as deep as that was, um, you, you know, it was awesome. My dad got to come to that set. Wow. Um, so yeah, man, it, that was an incredible experience. Yeah. Run me through the, I don't know if we talked about it because it was 12 years ago or whatever, but you do kill him softly. And then at, at that point, because they, you know, I, you can't even believe how delusional people are. They'll email me, right? Just random people that, Hey man, I know I got the shit. If I could just get an agent and a manager. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm 40 years on stage. I have neither. You know, I, re I recently got a manager, which is like fucking, you know. Pulling teeth. Yeah. So at what point do you have a manager and an agent to get into the room for killing him softly? Or did you go in on an open call or what, what happens there? Um, I had a, that's a great question. And I'll try and I probably what I say probably isn't right. But yeah. maybe me trying to recollect my memory of it. Um I had done a film called In Search of a Midnight Kiss that I had an agent at the time and a manager at the time, and they had advised me to not do this movie. <laughs> they were like, this is stop wasting time with your friends and your little friend's movies, and uh, it's pilot season right now. You need to be focusing on that. Pilot season. Yeah. Another thing gone, uh, but go ahead. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, I ended up letting them go yeah. uh, to go do the movie. And... Um, you know, it took us off and on about six months to shoot it. We had zero money, we had like 10 grand, 15 grand total for the whole shoot. But that film uh, ended up winning an Independent Spirit Award for the John Cassavetes Award. Best independent film under 500,000. Well, we sold it to a company in the UK called Vertigo Films. Vertigo Films had another small project they were trying to put together for about 500 grand called Monsters. Oh, yeah. And so... Through the distribution of that, I met this other company, and I did ended up doing Monsters. Well, Monsters, I think, put me on a, a small map that I started getting some calls, and I came in and read for Killing Them Softly probably four times. Unrepped. No, uh, no, sorry. Oh yeah, going back. Uh, once you let I, them go. Once I let them go, yeah. uh, my commercial agent, who I love, yeah, and to this day is my manager. I went to him. I was like, you need to represent me theatrically. And he's like, what? Like, I don't know anything about that. And I'm like, dude, it can't be that hard. Yeah. You're killing it commercially. Just do this. And he, you know, it was a little back and forth. And finally he was like, all right, all right, let's do it. And I've been with him ever since, man. And we, what's his name? John Pierce. That's cool. He had an agency called the John Pierce agency. And then he opened up a management company called the group management to, to help, to help my theatrical career. And then from there, man, um, he was, uh, you know, he was just, man, he's been passionate about me. Never, ever lost drive, never lost enthusiasm in 20 years. And I have to say that I got to give a lot of credit to him for having a career that I have because you got to have, you really, it really, really helps to have somebody pushing for you and really believing in you no matter what. And you look around at some other people and you can see that like man like if you know i can see they're incredibly talented and it's like man i just wish they had better representation to sell them in the way that they should sell right them. so i feel really grateful man that i i was i met this guy probably a year and a half from living in la i'm really close with his wife sharon you know and their son remy and they've just been like family to me and it's like having a a, a family that's that's really supportive and, and, and backing me so Anyways, that, that happened. Uh, Killing Them Softly came out. 
or no, we shot it, and then we shot Argo. Yeah. And it took two years for Killing Them Softly to like release from the time that we shot it. Wow. And Argo, I think I shot after that, and it came out that I couldn't get a job. I quit doing commercials. Yeah. Thinking there was this wave coming. Yeah. It didn't come. Not only that, it took forever for these things to come out. I quit. Yeah, I remember you quit. I moved to Texas. I know because I saw you and you go, I'm out of here. I'm out of here, man. Like, and I, I was like, what? And I moved back there. I was going to get my uh, contractor's license, start building houses. It's something that's pretty familiar. You're like the dude fucking from Bad News Bears, uh, Kelly Leak. <laughs> you know, he's like this actor. He does like Bad News Bears, Breaking Away. He's doing these films and then nothing. And he moves to Texas becomes a limousine driver oh, and like this. 25 years later he's driving some big producer and the guy goes hey man are are, are you like kelly leak from the bad news bears and he's all uh, yeah <laughs> he's all man i think i got something for you <laughs> and he's all nah dude i don't i, I that I was know. 30 years ago and it was little children and he got fucking nominated for an no. academy award and Way. then became Freddy Krueger, and he's been working again ever since. Yeah, man. I mean, the industry can, can sometimes really beat you up. You know? Oh, God, I mean, yeah. A big time. It can be brutal. But this city's times. full of those people. I mean, you got out, but this you see him cruising around like, what happened? For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So you and moved to like Texas. Nothing, and nothing happened. Nothing you know, it's happened. Just, it's just, you can't put your finger Well, on. I say this. It's a lot like playing slot machines. You're pulling the handle, you're pulling the handle, and you win a couple times, and then you keep pulling the handle, keep pulling out, and eventually you don't win anymore, and you're out. You're out. And then you either figure out how to survive till you can go pull the handle again, or you fucking, you're gone. Which is essentially just makes us all junkies. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Totally right. Anything I can, that I can get back, man. Just, just give me two it. cherries, oh, man. Time, man. Yeah, I'll, man. I'll take a cherry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that the industry has finally figured out these fucking junkies. Let's just give them little nibbles here, you know, with the streaming platforms and no more contracts and, and no residuals and shit. You know, it's turned into the music industry. I just know. It's fucking it's haunting. It's uh, it's the you know the industry really goes through transitions about every yeah. five to seven years. Yeah. And, uh, we're in the middle of one right now, and it's we always pop out on the other end. You just never know what it's going to look like when we do. So you you go out to Austin, and you're going to get your contractor's license. You're out there, you and your wife, right? Yeah, wife. You're and, fucking uh, fishing, you know. Fishing, mowing the yard. Yeah. You know, just um, out. Just out, and um. And I got Was there any depression? Mm, no, not then, man. I think that was probably one of the happiest times of my life. I was <laughs> sitting there. I love. I had a landscaping mowing company when I was in high school. In so did I. And so I was back smelling fresh cut grass. Yeah. Smell of gasoline when you're filling up. Just all of it, man. I was suns out. It was beautiful, man. I I was really stoked. But that that pipe dream wasn't going to last forever. I I had to work. Um. And so, I don't know, I think I was there for about six months. Yeah. And a filmmaker, uh, David Michaud, who was good friends with Andrew Dominic, who was the director of uh, Killing Them Softly, he called me up and, and said, hey, I really want you to come to Australia to do this film with Guy Pearce and Rob Pattinson. And I was like, you know, absolutely. It's like probably my first offer. Wow. So I, I was like, oh, yeah, sweet. Like, I'll, let me go just do this flick, and then I'll come back, and I'll get yeah. to work on the contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And while I was in Australia, I got a call for a TV show called Halt and Catch Fire, uh, which was supposed to be shot in Austin. So I was like, oh, I'll go back home and, and do this show. And that's the fireman show? No, that's the compu old 1980s computer computer birth of the personal computer show oh wow um that no one was watching by the way the four seasons that we made it wow but it made a big splash over the pandemic when people ran out of things to watch yeah and it, and it really really started doing well um anyways and from there man it just i just started getting jobs and and you know i left moved to texas and slowly 
just kind of came back into the fold. Um, Are you back here permanently? And then I ended up moving back to California um, in, 2000, in 2020. They all do. Yeah, right when the pandemic hit and yeah. everyone was leaving, I was like, all right, now I'm going back. This is a good time to get in here. It's, it's quiet. cheap. Yeah, it's quiet. quiet. Yeah. It's cheap. Everyone's gone. Um, so, But being in California on the second tour has been different, man. I just The city's different. I, I hike. I go to the beach. I yeah. surf. I mountain bike. Um, I wake up every morning, see the sunrise. I'm in bed by 9.30, 10 o'clock. I love going to bed at 9.30. It's a totally different city, man. Yeah. That's what's great about LA. You pick your poison. Yeah. There's a 2 a.m. or a midnight to 4 a.m. crowd, and there's a 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. crowd. And so That 6 a.m. crowd is doing shit. You realize, man. And the 2 to 4 when you're out in that for years like I was... Nobody's doing shit. Yeah. You're talking about doing talking shit. About you're at the 101 cafe figuring going, out Fuck, what I, you're going to do. I got some shit going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. well, I'm killing it. Yeah, yeah, I'm killing <laughs> it. My, my buddy came in town who hadn't been here in a while and he's like, What's everybody killing? Like, everybody <laughs> I talk to, they're, they're killing something. <laughs> what are they killing? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about what, uh, first of all, I am, a, I am a fucking movie freak always have been they they've motivated me and inspired me as much as uh music to where i'm just kind of like oh my god when i see a film it's like a great record but i would say once upon a time in hollywood it's once upon a time in hollywood there will be blood um no country for old men hey man like I, we have very similar taste these are the three Greatest films made in the last 20 years. There's other ones that I fucking love. Uh, Power of the Dog. Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, fucking. Rust and Bone. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that one I was just talking about with Francis. I forget what it's called. Goddamn, that movie's great. Moonlight, unbelievable. But Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, I did a Tarantino film. And, um, you know, there... They're all pretty derivative of something, you know, Reservoir Dogs, Japanese film, you know, Kill Bill, Japanese stuff, uh, Foxy Brown. Of course, we know that's a black exploitation era, that stuff. But I feel like with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he truly made his masterpiece. And it is like some of the best fucking filmmaking I've seen in years. I can't speak, obviously, for Quentin Tarantino. Um, fascinating human being. Totally. Totally. And I feel like Once Upon a, Ho time, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was a... It was all of his whole experience of moving to L.A., watching movies, being in the industry, uh, loving Japanese films, um, all of... And, and Quentin. Yeah. All wrapped up into one film you really got to see a real piece of his whole existence um in that film uh we all know that the guy's an encyclopedia for tv guest stars in television from the 1960s all the way up to guys who got one line in some yeah. movie that half of us never saw there's very there's not there's not, really no one else i've met in this whole industry in the last 20 years that has a brain and a and a to be able to recall and have that much knowledge about filmmaking and the industry and the people in it than Quentin Tarantino and I think that all shows up in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's to me it's it's come in as like Jaws. So to me it's it's Deer Hunter, Apocalypse Now, Jaws, Godfather One and Two, and now this. Meaning if I'm in a hotel room. And, and I'm flicking through channels and it's on or I'm on a plane. That's it. I'm fucking back in. I'm watching this thing all the way through. I just sit down and go, oh, yeah, I, I got to do this, you yeah, know? Same with the, like No Country for Old Men. You'll, oh, my God. You, same you, thing. It'll yeah. stop you in your tracks and be like, hold on, I just want to see this one scene. Yeah. And the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes gone by and you're just standing there in the middle of your living room watching it. You didn't <laughs> sit down. Yeah, yeah. You only were going to watch that one scene. Yeah. And it just grabs you. Uh, P.T. Anderson, too. He's, he's made some, just, some incredible uh, films. Even the ones that weren't financial successes are epic. Yeah. Just epic films. What was that, um, that Once Upon a Time Hollywood? 
you know, how many days you work on that? I maybe did two, three days on that that film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you're you're on this set. The authenticity of the look is is mind boggling. And, you know, so you get to the sets and stuff. Like, are you just like, wow. Well, I wasn't allowed to read the script. Yeah. I didn't get the script. I just had the one scene. And, uh, yeah, I went through the fitting. I, you know, I knew what I was supposed to do. And I knew I would be working with Leo. And, and, and I think uh, Timothy Oliphant. Yeah. He sees me from across the set in that Western thing. And I'm just kind of quiet, trying to stay out of everybody's way, you know, trying to get the lay of the land. And he can see, uh, this kid's a deer in headlights. Yeah, yeah. And so I see him walk from one end of the set all the way beeline and right to me. And yeah. he's like, they didn't give you the script, did they? And I was like, <laughs> no. He goes, all right, man, sit down. Let me fill you in on what's going on. Yeah. So kind, so nice. And he sat there and chatted with me for about 20 minutes about the whole movie and then this scene and what the scene's about and da 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 and, and uh, really made me feel really confident, really comfortable before we started shooting. And so that was sort of uh, my, uh, my experience in, in that. And then obviously Quentin comes in and does his, you know, uh, he's constantly giving like a speech about something or he'll re reference, like I said, some guest star role from a 1960s Western and you knew the guy's name and where he was from. That you just mesmerized that I didn't say much or do much on that set other than just watch him and listen. Him, yeah, him him talk and uh, and just you know shut up and learn. That I mean, that film, you're going in thinking it's the Manson story, you right, know, right? That, yeah. And 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 that is just this this like thing way over here, <laughs> you know. It was just done to establish the time. That's what that's, fuck, it. that's what makes it so fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. And then the right turn it takes at the end where people are all mad, like, that's some bullshit. I'm like, no, it's not, man. This yeah. is fucking amazing, you yeah. know? And and I don't think there's a better scene than Brad Pitt going, nah, it's something dumber than that. It's like Rex, you know? <laughs> you know? My, he does a dog. My, my favorite Brad scene is when he just... <laughs> Beats that dude up. Beats the shit out of Bruce Lee. Fix it. <laughs> dude, I can't even tell you how many times. Bill Burr and I, we go down to Tarantino's theater there, mm -hmm. and we fucking watch it. Just in his theater, in his world, with those Dalton, you know, the trailers before, the mm -hmm. fake TV show trailers. Oh, but yeah, man. Fuck, Just man. Great, great, great slice of cinema. There's a fantastic theater that Bill and I just did a um, benefit for. It's family owned, and uh, you have it, to go out there. It's in L.A.? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, hold on, let me get it for you here. Because this woman that owns it, um, hold on, let me get this. Because my brain, Gardena, Gardena Cinema. Where it's, is it? It's, it's uh, out by the airport, like, you know, out, out there. It's on Crenshaw. Okay. And it's a thousand seater old Damn. school theater, eight hundred seater, and it's you know, it's got the fucking look at it's got the it's got the marquee, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Throwback. And so Bill and I went out there and Bill fucking sold it out. Like Fear and Loathing there is playing there this week, you know. Oh, right on yeah, yeah, yeah. So this woman, she's unbelievable. Her family, they're immigrants that came over in the seventies, didn't speak English, saved money, bought this theater. Oh, that's and, beautiful. Yeah, and just fucking it's been the, the Gardenia. And they still own it. They still fucking that's own it, dude. Beautiful. Man. It is it is unreal, dude. So yeah. we did a, a comedy show in there, a thousand people. It was, we did the bowl this year. We Jeez, did the garden. Damn. We did fucking LA Forum. But that Gardena Cinema show was the most. It was special. so electric because the yeah. people, the neighborhood people are like, you're here helping her. This is where we bring our kids. I saw Jaws here in 77, that kind of shit, you know? Man, that's, I mean, those iconic places in LA, it's funny, Los Angeles is so quick to tear something down yeah. because it's only been there for 60, 70, 80 years. Yeah. And they'll just knock down a piece of history or architecture or, or something. It's a bizarre thing. And, and, and it feels like it's mostly only in Los Angeles. Um, so these relics. 
Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you, you really cling on to them when you see that they're still sitting there. And I know that, you know, Brian Cranston was also trying to save some, some theaters. And even the, it's, it's almost more important to save the smaller ones than it is the, the bigger ones, you know, because, because those are the ones that just have so much, so much great history in them, you know. I remember right now the theater in San Francisco where I saw Star Wars. Uh, you know, I saw the towering Inferno and, and, and all these movies. It was called the Coronet. And it's I know the Coronet. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the most beautiful theaters. It's weird to think about those theaters back then. Like downtown, there's like I think there's 85 of them or something. Incredible. Insane. Theaters. And they, they got three balconies. There would be a th- the 2000 people would go to a movie. You know, that uh, independent film I was speaking about earlier, it's 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 sort of based around that and it was it was not really it's based around a rom-com, but the couple go downtown to look at these old theaters that have jewelry stops uh, shops in front of them now. Yeah. And a couple of them were like, hey, can we go look at the back? Yeah. And you go back there and it's storage. Yeah. But the stage is still there. Some of the seats are still there. A lot of them have been removed. It's got, you know, 60 foot ceilings. The whole uh, ceiling is covered in like this wooden architecture. Tall, uh, ornate. Not, yeah. And it's like, they're all still there. They're there. They're shells. And I, I, I just hope that one day. Oh, yeah. Broadway in Los Angeles reopens it would be insane because all that uh infrastructure is still there it just needs to be retrofitted and fixed up and polished and and and, and whatever but you know the orpheum is obviously still in in working condition but there was so many others that you don't even realize it's a theater because there's a storefront in front of it right s- selling something you know yeah that's fucking wild how many movie theaters at one time were downtown la and that they had enough people that were going in there every day to see these movies in these 2,000 seaters. It's fucking Insane. nuts. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, down, downtown has you know, gone through some roller coaster transitions over the last Yeah, it goes years. up and down. Yeah. They keep going, yeah. It it, you got to move down. It's, it's nice and revives now. And it's like, well, two streets are good on the whole, <laughs> whole city. That's it. You ever take a it's, wrong turn down it's, there? It's, it's like nice crack zombies. Revised. No, they just built one building on yeah. the 7th and Grand. Yeah. It's been revised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know if you saw that huge um, uh, mall hotel thing that uh, the graffiti artist of course. tackled. Um, which is... Uh, yeah, that thing, the Chinese builders or whatever, uh, they, they split, went yeah. bankrupt just left them yeah yeah um i don't know what they're gonna do about that thing yeah but um yeah man downtown is i'll still I, I go down there all the time just walk around i love it whether it's in a good place or a bad place um you been to that place downtown i shot a movie there it's like seven floors each floor is something different a bar a jail a nightclub and no. it's like a studio And you can go and shoot, like, say you're doing like a Barney Miller kind of police type of sitcom. You just shoot on floor four. And then you go to floor five and it's like a 70s nightclub. And it's all these sets and they're like permanent. No, I I, I did go to a place over in Glendale that we were walking through shooting. And it had a courtroom set up. And I was like, oh, what do they shoot here? And they're like, nothing. Yeah. It's for anybody that needs a courtroom. They just come here and shoot the courtroom. They come here and shoot an FBI office. Yeah, that's what this place is like. Yeah, which I think is in a way much smarter and more uh, financially affordable to... Yeah. Instead of trying to build the waste. Have you shot in a, on a lot in years? Like a Universal or any of those lots? Man. N- n- like, do they do that anymore? I think they do. I, man, I, I don't get those. I get the jobs that are in, you know, in the remote skirts of Mexico City yeah. and some. Always. Yeah, with me. Know, yeah. Desert or off in the countryside of, you know, so, you know, I, I, I very rarely. Lancaster. Disney Ranch, <laughs> yes, yeah, or somewhere just you know remote, which I like. You know, I do too. I, I, I enjoy that, but I, I no distractions. I, yeah, I have not sat shot in a soundstage since I can't even remember. To be honest with you, what are you working on now? Um, on the present moment, I don't know when this is coming out because they're trying to keep next it week right Monday. Uh, I'm working on a uh, Netflix job, but I'm not allowed to say oh. which one it is. Oh shit! Uh, because they've been trying to keep it 
like quiet. So I'm in the process of that. Um, is it a series or a movie? Limited series. Okay, got ya. Yeah, and um, so I'm going back and forth on that down to Mexico uh, City. Wow. And uh, oh, that sounds like some cartel stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> not always, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, I did two years down there on a show. Oh, which one? Uh, uh, True Nar- Detective? No, Narcos. Oh, Narcos. Yeah, and so I have a very uh, familiar. I forgot you were on that, dude. I'm- well, well, I was in the Narcos Mexico, not Narcos Colombia. Right, right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, uh, but I remember that because uh, I think I ran into you at the comedy store and you said you were working on that at the time. Because yeah. I... It's weird. I run into you at the comedy store. It's like the only place I go out. I know. And the funny thing is, you fucking know me, and you never text and go, going to the store tonight. I don't tell anybody. I know. Because I, it's random. I'll, be, I'll say to Sosie, I'm like, hey, wh- wh- what are we doing tomorrow night? And she'll yeah. be like, I don't know. I'm like, let's go up there and see some comedy. Yeah. Man, there's nothing better than the comedy store, because you pay 20 25 bucks, and you're guaranteed yeah out of three four five six sets you're guaranteed to walk out of there feeling good feeling like you got a good laugh yeah. feeling like i mean it, it really is the best guaranteed comedy uh place in, in in that i've ever been to and so we always go down there just to you know i, I need some comedy I need to yeah. laugh in my life you know you were there last week. You saw me. Yeah, <laughs> great. And it was so funny you did the act about it. Man, there's always that guy who's got the bad back. <laughs> Come on. And I was laughing because I'm that guy. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, <laughs> my back is bothering yeah. me. Yeah. And you kept going with that bit, dude, and it just got more and more accurate. <laughs> I, I just, I think you closed with that bit, man, and and I just, man, I just thought it was so funny, man. And I was just like, you couldn't have nailed that more to a T. So great. You know, it's funny, the comedy store has pretty much given me everything in my career. Uh, the comedy store and and the great Bill Burr has obviously helped me immensely uh, over the years. Uh, Marin, Joey Diaz, these guys have really, uh, you know picked me up and because they saw that i was you know working my ass off and you shit did, man i have to say that you worked your ass off oh my god it's fucking nuts but it's the people i've seen in the audience you know fuck dude i was slaying one night dr dre was there and i got off stage it happened to be one of those magic electric sets where even i know i go man i was I was fucking murder, you know? And this guy comes out, hey, uh, uh, Dr. Dre would like to meet you. And you're like, Dr. Dre, what the fuck? No you know, Francis Ford Coppola, Brad Pitt's in there, in and out of there a lot. Uh, Leo, uh, a lot. Last time I was at Quentin Tarantino was sitting two Quint- seats over from Quentin, me. Quentin, there's times where he's there weeks every night, just down there engulfed. And at one point I thought he was secretly maybe doing some kind of comedy movie. That's how much he was there. You know, it's a relief, man, that place and uh, the, the, how private it is. There's no cameras there's no phones. It's no, great. You know, and, and also getting to see you guys work out material yeah. and then seeing y'all's uh, special. Yeah. It's like, Oh my God, you can see the development of that story or that joke. Um, it's like being in an acting class or something with some of the greats. You get to see their process, yeah. And how they they figure it out, man, and that's that's gold. Have you ever thought of uh, trying stand up? I write stuff all the time, little yeah. bits and stuff yeah. like that. But no, I've never like put together a. You whole, should try it. Yeah, I, I I come down and do five one night when I have a show. Just fucking it, it, people don't understand. Even if you bomb, it's funny. It might not <laughs> feel funny at the time. But you definitely, what I find when you start is a lot of times somebody like you who's got some chops on a movie set and stuff, your first set will be pretty good. And then it just it oh, takes a dip. Yeah, and that's where you have to figure out how to get out of that dip and not quit because your second and third one... You're just, is it because the first one you bring in all this nervous energy or this uncomfortable energy that people can see, do you think? I think it's because it's coming out very organically the very first time. Yeah. And the skill of comedy is just like acting. You have to be able to tell it over and over and over without being like, 
uh, this is just a story. It has to look like it's the first time. And so you start analyzing it. You're listening to your recording or whatever, and then you become a robot trying to do it word for word like you did that first night. You're chasing it. And then eventually you figure it out or you quit. That's very similar kind of to the theater. Same thing. You know, you have a good show one night and you're like, oh, I got to laugh on that line. And you go for it the next night and it bombs. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, like, hold on. Like, yeah, I got to get, I got a whole rest of the play to do here. Yeah. I it's in your head now. Out now. Yeah. Like nothing that didn't work. Like nothing's working. I suck. Uh, I just need to get off the stage and regroup, you know, but you have to go through that like, like on stage. Um, how many plays have you done? I haven't done a play in eight years wow. or something like that. I did a lot, you know, when I first moved out here and I did some back in, in Texas and a little bit growing up as a kid, but it was like theater that you, like, your parents are like, get out of the house. We're dropping you off yeah. here on Yeah, Thursdays. we need to fuck. We, need we don't need you here. <laughs> I was just talking about that. The parents would d get rid of you so they could fuck or just have freedom, you know? I think just freedom. Summer camp. Yeah. Uh, base <laughs> Little League. And I'm a parent now, so I yeah. kind of understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but yeah, man. You know, Bill Burr is getting ready to do Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, which is... No fucking way. Yeah, on Broadway. In, uh, no way. I think it's in March, I believe, or something. But I'm so happy for him because, you know, he's really, uh, you know, he seems to pick the cool shit. I mean, he knows how to filter out the bullshit, you know, like he did, he did Breaking Bad. He did the Chappelle show. You know, when you see him in stuff, he did the Mandalorian. It's killer primo stuff, totally, you know. Now totally. he's going to do Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And it's, it's just cool to see your friend like, holy shit, that is fucking cool. Because I saw that play as a, a, a young guy in my 20s. And, of course, the film... And I love plays. I saw a Sam Shepard play. This one was Sean Penn, Nick Nolte, and Cheech Marin. What play was it? Oh, God. I got, I got to look it up. Hold on. The last you. play I did was a Sam Shepard play. Hold on. Uh, let me get this. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Play. It was True uh, West. Sean Penn. Sean Penn, who is like one of my all-time favorites. Oh, dude. Legend. Um, Absolutely. Nick legend. Nolte. Here it is. Henry Moss. Henry Moss. Yep. Out of, um, God, blanket on that. Play. Out of what book was it? Or was it a single standalone? I saw it in November. Look oh, at it. Recently. No, no. This is when I was young, man. This is uh, 2000. Got it. Got right. It. And uh, so the late Henry Moss, the world premiere of Sam Shepard's newest play starring... Nick Nolte, oh yeah, Woody Harrelson, I forgot he was in it. Cheech Marin and Sean Penn opens in San Francisco at the Square, November 14th. The Henry Moss world premiere, um, let's see, 1999 Academy Award nominee, Nolte stars. I saw it with Nolte, and at one point his voice was going sour, and they, there was like weeks where he wasn't on, and it was the sub. I was like, thank God I didn't get the sub. Oh, because his voice was had a hard time making it through the whole run. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I recently saw the Jaws play on Broadway. It's uh, the shark is broken, and it has Robert Shaw's son who plays no Robert way. Shaw. Yeah, yeah, dude, it was fucking amazing. Who plays Jaws? Yeah, the, <laughs> who plays Jaws? <laughs> See, there's your fucking. I auditioned for that, but you know, yeah, I, yeah. My teeth I didn't have big enough teeth. Up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you remind me of man, a very young Bill Paxton. Oh, legend, man! Oh, g g great yeah, friend you, of mine. You know, I, I, I have a friend that worked with him um, and was good friends with him, and he has these great Bill stories. Oh God, I got too. It's you, crazy. You know, I, and hearing them, and also, you know, that guy was a totally different kind of actor. He he was so excited to be there, such a fan of oh god of the industry and the people that he was working with. That I, it was so sad. I, I just I, I didn't get to work with him, 
Man. You know, and I just wanted to to experience that energy and and uh, that that persona that um, I hear so much about it from so many people that knew him, and I do I feel like I missed out on that. Fucking love that guy. I miss him so much. He did the podcast two weeks before he passed, oh, and so uh, sorry. it's just it was just brutal. I mean, it just absolutely brutal. And he was a guy who. I would just run into in LA like out at night and then that was it. We were out all night. Like, ah, yeah. Dean, you yeah. fucking guy, yeah. you know? And it was just, he was magic, man. His son's acting now. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually know his son, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Jim Flowers, uh, was good friends with Bill. He AD'd on a bunch of his project. He acted in some of them too, but he's really close with Bill's son and his son's been, uh, he's doing well. Wow. Yeah, do, do yeah really he is. Well. Yeah, he just yeah. did the twisters. Mm -hmm. So you're still riding. Still what are you riding? riding? Uh, at the moment, today, I rolled over the uh, Ducati Monster 1100 EVO. Oh, yeah, cool. And uh, But, you know, I'm mostly getting into adventure bike riding. I love it. Right GS now. is my favorite bike. The, tw tw uh, the 1250, yeah. you know. I got a couple 800, F800 GSs. Those are great. Uh, we got an African Twin 1100. <sighs> you got some bikes Bill and I can ride? Yeah, dude, I got a whole garage. Oh, let's do that. Yeah, man, I got a couple Ducati scramblers, some Triumphs. Oh, scramblers, fuck. Uh, stuff that fits all sizes. Got some dirt bikes. Y'all want to go rip in the desert? Oh, dude, that'd be great because Bill and I always want to ride, but they, nobody rents bikes anymore. Yeah, no, man. I could, I could, you guys take out the Ducati scrambler. Oh, I love the it. Scrambler. I love you the scramblers. Go just putt around on yeah. them. Yeah. You know, just have a good time. Go carve some canyons. Let's do it, dude. I love that. Is Bill, is he, is he ride? Well, I, I taught him how to ride like Gosh. 10 years ago. Then he had okay. kids. He quit. But then I interviewed the CEO of Ducati on the show. Okay. That guy became great, great friends with me. And he goes, anytime you're in uh, Colorado, I'll load up the bikes and we'll... Wait, what's his name? Jason. Shunuk. I was just with Jason. Whoa, really? Downtown at the bike shop for uh, that Desert uh, X... Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, he was uh, there. ...presentation. Yeah. So, long story short, we're putting together a Baja 1000 film. Yeah. And he's gotten us to uh, Desert X's for the yeah. shoot. And, um, <clears throat> man, the guy's been so great. He's, he's so, so cool. helpful. He's the best. He's the best, man. So nice. Uh, I met him through a, a good friend of mine, the director of the film we're making, Nathan Weatherington, who he goes and rides in Colorado with him. Yeah, so, yeah. So we were small out. Small world, man. Yeah, we were out in Colorado. And uh, he loaded up two Diavels and a Multistrada. And we rode through. We went up to the Shining Hotel. Oh, killer. Dude. Killer. And then two weeks ago, Bill and I rode the new road glides all through, like, the Santa Barbara Mountains. Amazing. The road, gl uh, road glides Harleys? Yeah. The man. electric Harleys? No, 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 no. It's the road glides, the big bagger yeah, with yeah, the yeah. fixed fairing. Yeah, Just yeah, doing yeah. 100 one-handed because the bike is just so stable. Just two more wheels short of a car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, man, what a bike, dude. I hadn't rode new Harleys in six years, you yeah. know? yeah. Holy shit! All right, well I'll tell Bill, and the three of us will go Ab riding. Absolutely, man. That would be that would be that would be. Amazing. I taught Bill to ride right here in Griffin Park. What'd you teach him on? Uh, we got him a Triumph Bonneville. When Perfect. He, yeah, Perfect. when he was starting out. Got it. And then he it. had kids. He got rid of it, but now he wants to get the uh, Road Glide Screaming Eagle Road Glide. Oh, nice. Yeah. What are, you, what are you riding these days? I don't have anything right now because I had the neck surgery. I got ran over. Oh shit. Yeah, some fucking meth head hit me doing seventy. I had neck oh, surgery. Damn. Damn. But, but now I'm back in, and Bill and I are gonna go to a stunt school and learn how to do like. Like like slide like, the bike. Yeah, slide the bike and wheelies and. You ever done the California Superbike School? No, but my buddy runs it for Breeze, and we're gonna go out there. I'm telling you, man. Like, have you done it? I, many a times. Oh yeah. And uh, you be so surprised on the stuff they teach you on the track. Yeah. How much that is incorporated into just riding around the street. I yeah. didn't see the correlation. Yeah. But having done it, I'm like everything I've learned at that school has made me a better writer, not as a racer, as a, just a writer on the street. Of course. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I tell this story. I just learned to ride by just getting on. And then about 
20 years into riding, my buddy wanted to start riding. He goes, hey, man, he is really wealthy. And he goes, I'll pay you, dude, to go to the bike school with me. I don't want to go alone. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I feel weird. And so I get to, you don't have to pay me. I'll just, let's just go and have some fun. And it was Highway Patrol taught the school. And fucking, I was learning shit. Like counter steering, I never even knew that the first twenty years of riding. Yeah, counter steering, uh, trail breaking, trail breaking, all this shit, all this stuff that uh, just just makes you a, a, a better rider, man. And like getting out on the track, you want to go fast. Like yeah. that's the safest place in the world to do it. Totally, yeah. You know, so we're, I'm getting back into riding, but I'm into the riding of destination riding like bill and i do wyoming and then we ride through wyoming you know like wide open spaces dude we were riding in santa barbara mountains there wasn't a fucking so you could pull off and just piss in the street there was no one around that's the riding i like doing remember when the pandemic hit oh that was and insane they shut down la yeah and it turned into one massive racetrack people were just doing a hundred on the I, highways i could do a hundred down sunset whoa there was wasn't one car. Yeah, it's, you know, four lane road street, no cars. Just we, killer. Me and Taylor just were. I, I mean, the first month of it when there was no cars, we were on our motorcycles every morning at eight a.m. <laughs> we woke up and just plowed. Went through about two gas tanks. Yeah, and then would come home and just be like, "Man, this is not going to last forever." So let's just keep enjoying it, dude. We're on it. Me, you, and Bill will go riding. I love it. I love it. Thanks love for it. doing the show, dude. Hey, man, dude. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, God, I love you, man. It's yeah, great. Yeah, man. And then congrats to you on how all the other comedy stuff, man. It's just incredible. And I, I love seeing you keep going up and keep rising. So, um, congrats uh, to you, dude. Oh, cheers, man. I, you know, somebody this morning said, dude, you know everybody. Like, how do you know Scoot? If you stay in this town long enough and you don't fuck people over and you're, you're you know, good people, you're cool, you start to. Even if I only see you twice a year, those are bumps you need in LA. It's like, oh, yeah. Dude, when you meet good people out here in this town, yeah. you cling to them with your totally. claws. Totally. Ah. You really do, yeah, man. Yeah. Because uh, it's, it's not rare, but it's, you know, with yeah, you how just good know. it is. Solid thing. dudes. Solid people. Yeah. yeah. Solid people. All right, buddy. Killer Dean, man. Well, it's great, man. Thank you, man, for awesome. doing the show. There you guys go. Uh, you got Instagram or? No social media. Great. No. Wow. What yeah. a fucking winner. Zero. What a winner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a yin and a yang to everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. See you later. <laughs>